All right, there we go. Well, there's a couple of things about this story we need to know uh, put in the promotion uh, that uh, this is this is going to be about David and Jonathan, but it's a little bit down the road. Uh, so, uh, and I'm not sure where that's coming from. So if you guys could check your background noise for us, it would be helpful. Uh, but David and Jonathan had, you know, uh, David was anointed as king, and then him and Jonathan just got to be really, really tight, uh, even though Saul was trying to kill David. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, Jonathan just didn't, just didn't get it. And this whole friendship, right, this is just bizarre you know, from, from our perspective, because Jonathan essentially, by helping David become king, was making himself not king, and he was very, very brave. So at this point, David is out in the wilderness. He's got like 400 guys that have come and are hanging out with him, uh, and, uh, and he's moving them from one place to another, hiding from Saul, uh, and uh, just prior to this story, he went he heard that there was a town that was being attacked. And so he took his men and they attacked these people that were attacking this Jewish town and just wiped them out. And so he's staying in this town and he asked the priest to go to God and say, hey, if, if will these people turn me over to Saul? And God said, oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're gonna turn you over basically you know, first chance they get. And so can, can you imagine what, you know, for David is like, God, really? And, and, and so he left from there, uh, but Saul was just really, you know, you can almost feel the tension just building and building and, and building uh, in, in this uh, tension between Saul and this perceived threat uh, from him. And that leads us to our story from God's word. Uh, so David then stayed in the wilderness of Ziph uh, among the wilderness strongholds in that hill country. Uh, and Saul, he, he searched for David every day, but the Lord did not allow David to fall into Saul's hands. And while David was in the wilderness of Ziph in Horesh, he realized, Saul's, Saul's trying to kill me. And it, it, so it was then that Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, he came to David in Horesh to encourage him in his faith in God. And he said to David, don't be afraid because my father is never going to lay a hand on you. You are going to be the king and I am going to be your second in command. And my father, Saul, he knows this. And so there in Horesh, David and Jonathan made a covenant in the presence of God. And then Jonathan went home, but David stayed in Horesh. And that's our story from God's word, right? Uh, so I'm just going to kind of get you guys to help me uh, re retell the story. Uh, and, and now, Susan, you're going to notice just a few things different than the model we do at a workshop, right? Uh, and one of the reasons I'm skipping the volunteer because we already have a group of people who getting us to talk is not a problem. <clears throat> getting us to talk one at a time can be a struggle, but uh, getting us to talk is not a problem. Uh, so let's, uh, let's just look through this story together. David then stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hill country of, do you remember the title of this place? It's a hard one. So if you didn't get it, I understand. The yeah, the wilderness of, of Ziph. Oh, Ziph. Yeah. 
Uh, and while he was up there, what was happening? Saul was looking everywhere for him. Yeah, every day Saul was searching for him, but God would let him fall into his hands. Yeah, God would not let David fall into Saul's hands. And so David was in the wilderness of Ziph when what? When he realized Saul's trying to kill me. Talk about the slow student in the class, right? Uh, yeah, he realized that Saul is trying to kill him. Uh, and right after that, something happened. Uh, Jonathan came. Yeah, Saul's son, Jonathan, came to him. Do you remember the reason that Saul's son came to him? Andrew. We don't hear what you're saying, Dad. You're mic, Dad, Andrew. Encourage him in the Lord. Yeah, to encourage him in his faith in the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, and he started, he started his encouragement by saying, what? Don't, Sorry, don't be you. afraid. Don't be afraid because... My father's not going to lay a hand on you. Yeah, my dad's not going to lay a hand on you. You're going to be king. And I'll be your second in command. Yeah. And my father knows this. Yeah. He knows this. Right. Uh, and so then. Covenant. Made a covenant. Yeah. Jonathan David made a covenant in the presence of God. Yeah. In the presence of the Lord. And then Jonathan. At home. David. 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 Uh, David in, Horeb. in Horesh. Yeah. Horesh. So, man, what do you think it might have been like to be David and the, you're, you've, you've risked your men, you've risked your life, even though you're running from somebody that's chasing you, right? This is, this is like the original premise of the old time television movie, uh, TV series called The Fugitive, right? He's, <laughs> David's fleeing from this guy while at the same time trying to help other people. Uh, and, and he's like, are they going to turn me in? Yeah, they're going to turn you in. And then the realization comes to him, Saul's trying to kill me. So what do you think might have been going on emotionally at that point? Fear. Fear? Right. Desperation. Oh, but good one. Can't yeah. get anything right, you know, you you try to leave in the morning and your foot gets stuck in the mud and then you pull your shoe off and then your sock gets wet. I mean, it's just like one thing after another. <laughs> Everything just gets worse. <laughs> yeah. Good film about what? About a situation. <clears throat> so he tried to help these people. They were going to betray him. Now he's starting to realize Saul is trying to kill him. Uh, discouraged. Yeah, discouraged. Nervous. Nervous. Okay. Yeah. Don't we? You know, another thing. Hey, you know, just, just. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Don't we? I think he may be angry. Ooh. Okay. Elaborate on that a little bit. Because he he he's faithful to Saul and. He reached out to help all those people in that city, but they all they are all against him right now. Yeah. Okay. So man, I'm trying to do all the right stuff and bam. Oh, I like that. Now, Andrew, what were you gonna say? Another thing he might have felt is just stupid. Um, that he finally real hey, wait a minute, this guy's trying to kill me. But you know, <laughs> hold, hold on to that for a second. I'm an idiot. Yeah, yeah I want to I want to get to that in just a minute. Yeah, Diane. Yeah, I think maybe also that thing where once you come to a realization, there's some facts that sort of lined up. If now you go like, oh, what was the thing with him? Let me marry his daughter. And well, yeah, and you know, it's like all of a sudden all these things make sense. And you're like, ugh. Yeah, all the all the puzzle pieces start falling into place. Yeah, all right. Well, let's look at the first part of this story. 
so David then stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph, uh, and Saul searched for him every day. But God did not allow David to fall into Saul's hands. And while he was in the wilderness of Ziph in Horesh, David realized that Saul was trying to kill him. And let's just stop right, right there. So what do we learn about David from, from what he was, I mean, when you hear the strongholds of the wilderness and the hill country, uh, so what, what do we learn about David from, from what he's doing here? Sounds like he's trying to hide to me. Yeah. He probably knows the area. He knows the area well. He knows that it's pretty much impenetrable. They're in one valley to cross to the other is fairly simple. Lots of caves. So he's he's using Can't the terrain it. that he knows, right? Yeah. Yeah. What did you say he was originally doing out there? Well, we, we're not really told. I mean, he's he's been fleeing there for a while, going from place to place, city to city, uh, actually kingdom to kingdom at different times prior to this. So he's just been in a state of fleeing for a little while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's he's been kind of flea mode for a while, but it's, it's not a whole lot earlier than this that these 400 men have come to join him. Uh, and... Uh, from what we can learn, these are not like the top. <laughs> Everybody that was distressed, in debt, and what was the other one? It's not like yeah, there's one other word. Loser, loser. Yeah, I was going to say basically losers. So, <laughs> well. So David ran in different places. Did could he have done something else? Could have just confronted Saul. Went right you know, he Saul. could have left entirely the entire country and just gone so far away. Yeah. Start over just you know a thousand miles away where they can't get. Yeah, I feel like having 400 men kind of makes you noticeable. You could have totally went under the radar. Yeah. But he knows he's been anointed to be king, so maybe that's why he's staying around. Mm -hmm. But I don't get why he's hiding if he doesn't know that, that um, Saul's trying to kill him. Well, let's talk about that. He has known that Saul has been chasing him, that Saul has been pursuing him. That's He's got that. So when it says, while he was in the wilderness of Ziph in Horesh, and he realized that Saul was trying to kill him, what do you see there? I mean, is that just like, you know, he, like, like you say, I mean, he, has he known that Saul was chasing him before this? Yeah. Yeah. Is he, I mean, he, he, uh, threw the javelin at him when he was at the palace a couple of yeah. times. Yeah. That's definitely a death threat, it seems to be anyway. Yeah, I, I would take that as relatively threatening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah, he's yeah. trying to think the best of Saul. Mm. Mm. David was raised a shepherd and the youngest son. And it's really nice, I think, to have a non-politician that's going to be king. Um, and it's just the total naivety of how things work when people are trying to kill you politically. And it's, it's, it was nice to see, actually, uh, in our lifetime. Uh, and here's a real beautiful picture of, of a non-politician and the way he deals with things and the way people try to deal with him because he's a threat to them, to the standard order of things. So when it says that he realized 
Saul was trying to kill him. What do you, what do you see there? I think that he, he woke up to the reality of, of, wow, this is a real political game here. I mean, this is real. This, this, this is a real nasty political Game of Thrones kind of thing. And I'm not, he's not qualified for it. I mean, emotionally, physically, uh, technically, he's not qualified for playing the politic, political game. He's just not. And nothing wrong with that. Well, let me dig into that a little bit. I, I want to hear from some of the rest of you as well. So Andrew sees this as a political game. So when he says that David realized he's trying to kill me, mm -hmm. right? Do you see it going even beyond that? Beyond killing? Killing's no, pretty far. The political. Oh. <laughs> well, he wanted his son, Jonathan, to be king. It's pretty clear. Yeah. And thought that he should be. Didn't God also tell him, like, Saul, your line's not going to be king. He ruined it. And yeah. so I guess he'd be fighting against what God had already told him. Mm. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, and, and it is interesting because in a previous story, uh, when Saul is talking to Samuel, he says, your God. He says that several times in several different places. Uh, and so he's, he, he's somehow, somewhere deep inside, he's recognized, yeah, this, this situation has changed dramatically. So, yeah, Diane. I think for David, Saul is the Lord's anointed. Um, they fought battles together. He's his son-in-law. He's he's got some moods, definitely some serious mood swings. But it's gonna take a while. I think it just takes a while to realize what's really happening. Um, that this man now wants to kill you. Yeah, does, does it seem like suddenly David came to the, oh, wait a minute, he's not just chasing me. He's, he's chasing me for the express purpose of putting me out of his misery. And is that, is that what you guys kind of see in this part of the story? So what other reason would Saul have wanted to chase David for if not to kill him? Well, uh, in David's mind, it could have just been to, you know, to arrest him, to, uh, I mean, there was. Punishment. Yeah, punishment, what, whatever. I mean, there's a, who, who knows what's going through your mind. I mean, there's times that I've, you know, people have been trying to do things against me in positions of authority I've had and uh, you know you your mind plays you, you you go through all these what ifs what are they doing what's their purpose yada 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 you know you fill in the blank kind of things so well what do we learn about Saul from the fact that it says he looked every day for David possessed oh I like that word yeah yeah like, like he is honed in, right? Dream uh, with really much else. What was that, Mo? I was going to say he doesn't have time to do much else, probably, so he's probably not being a very good king, which we probably Ooh, already know. Yeah. He's ruling well. <laughs> yeah. Cheryl? Oh, I just said he's green with jealousy. Ooh, yeah. Johnny? He had a lot of perse perseverance, but not in a good way. He was perseverant toward a bad thing. Oh, that's a bad person. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Andrew. Yeah, I agree with Jason, Jason Moe there that um, not a lot is about being done constructively for the kingdom. Yeah, Certainly and I no 
in the introduction, just before this, it says he took all the uh, took all the soldiers uh, mm. of Israel to go after David. So certainly no current event uh, parallels to today at all. But. Yeah, we're not going to talk about those. So I didn't. <laughs> so and and then what do we learn about God from the fact it says and the Lord did not allow David to fall into Saul's hands. So what is that? You know, we, we've talked a little bit, just mentioned briefly about sovereign. Briefly about sovereign. That's what I was going to say. So what do you, go ahead and say it, Sarah. You're oh, God was just being sovereign. He's in control of the situation. Okay. You know, it's interesting that, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, don't we? I mean, God didn't stop Saul to do that. He he didn't want Saul to stop chasing. Oh, wow. He didn't allow him to fall into his hands, but he didn't stop Saul from looking for him every day. Yeah. Oh, what do some of the rest of you think about that? That's an interesting observation. Yeah, Andrew? He didn't tell David to stop hiding and doing what he can do to get out of trouble. Yeah. Either that was that was part of the reality of, but I mean, recognizing that God was delivering him, uh, but also delivering him by what he did as well. So there's a wow. lot of uh, action through faith there. Yeah, Johnny. Yes. Uh, there's a there's a scripture that says David was according to God's own heart, went after God's own heart. So which that believe that God had David in, in the palm of his hand. And when you're in God's hands, it, it, it's really hard to to take somebody out of God's hands if mm -hmm. God doesn't allow it. Yeah. Alright, well let's, yeah, Diane. Um, he also doesn't um let Saul be delivered into David's hands. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's he's kind of keeping these kings separate. He has a, a plan for the death, it appears, yeah. of Saul that's going to be in a way that's going to set David up to take the kingship in an honorable way. Mm. Yeah. How was the Lord's anointed according to David? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting here because we have two Lord's anointed, right? I mean, that's just, uh, that, that'll, that'll blow your theology. Yeah, Mo. I, I just, um, yeah, I find it encouraging because I didn't, I wouldn't have really thought of that, of like, um, that he's not stopping things. He is, like, the easy answer is like, that I was going to say is, this, you know, well, he's his anointed, you know, it's his promise to him. And that's true, but it's not, life hasn't life isn't stopping for david he's not just sit, like okay well i'm the anointed one so i'll just sit here like he's still having to do things like uh, andrew said and and um saul's still pursuing he's not stopping any of that but he is protecting him so life is going on in the midst of and the promise is still being fulfilled yeah i i wonder if in our our uh prosperity churches you know our, our friends that that would uh lean towards the prosperity gospel, if they do a whole lot of sermon series from the places where David is being chased across the wilderness, <laughs> you know, because it's kind of like, ah. yeah, Cheryl. You know, I, th I wonder, I, I wonder if God is um, allowing this to go on because of those men, those men that are just having problems and maybe God's love for those men and and having David shepherd them and bring them into like as growing them up um and even some of his brothers I think were in that group you know they yeah. they even united with him so maybe it was you know, part of his plan to reach and help those, those men. 
So not just preparing David for the kingship, but preparing those who are going to come along beside him uh, later on. Oh, yeah. His, his um, came a lot. So, yeah, Diane. Yeah. Um, uh, Butch um, said uh, a couple of weeks ago, Cheryl, that you were the sweetest person he knows. And while you're saying these things about rescuing, you know, these bad guys, I'm thinking, well, dealing with these um, men of um, dubious motives and backgrounds probably does prepare one for court if you've been a little naive. Yeah, yeah, he's you know, he could be preparing David for what he's going to face later on as king. I hadn't thought about that. That's really good. <laughs> Not just the soldiers, but David's like, what am I going to do with these guys? So, okay, who stole the royal goat? So. <laughs> well let's do the, the next part of the story uh so then saul's son jonathan came to david in the wilderness of Horesh to encourage david in his faith in the lord uh and and he said don't be afraid uh because my father is not going to lay his hand on you you're going to be king. I'm going to be your second. I'm going to be your second in command, and my father knows that this is true. Uh, and so we'll just we'll just stop right there for for a second. So what do we learn about David? I mean, what what do we see in this story about David from what Jonathan says or does? I think um, David's faith needed to be upheld at that time and God knew that so he sent his good friend to sort of hold up his arms like Aaron and the oh, yeah. oh, um, what's going to say uh, yeah I like that yeah Andrew David let himself be found um it just it surprises me that Jonathan was able to find him um it surprises me sometimes when, like, journalists do the same thing. They encamp with people that we're looking for. And uh, David lets himself be found by Jonathan. So that's an interesting thing. There's a lot of trust there. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. What does that show us about Jonathan and David and their covenant? Uh, a lot of mutual trust. Yeah. Well, can we learn anything about David emotionally? Can we see anything in the story? If Jonathan's first words are, don't be afraid. He's afraid. <laughs> so, and if you are trying to encourage, so when you hear the word encourage, what do you think of? Discouraged. He is discouraged. Oh, okay, that he is discouraged. Yeah, yeah, and so he needs to have courage. And and I love that word, encourage. Encouragement is simply putting courage in somebody, right? I mean, that's. Uh, so, you know, I, th I think a lot of times we look at leaders and we think of them as being not quite human, right? That they're above the emotional stuff. Uh, but what do we learn about David as far as his, like, he's put himself out there and now. <laughs> yeah. So I think he's, I think he's learning some new, new lessons about how to keep standing and be encouraged. I mean, he learned some of them in the field, but this is like a totally, like a totally different, different level. level. So he had to go from faith to faith, so to speak, rather than just the faith of the lion and the bear wasn't enough for this. Oh, yeah. I like that. What's some of the rest of you think? You know, Butch, one thing is, is, is one thing is learning is just running because you're afraid of being arrested. Uh, and the other thing is running because they're going to kill you. Yeah. And since I've never had to do either one, I really thank God for that. But David woke up to that reality 
They're trying to kill me. And um, yeah, that could be very scary. Yeah. yeah. That could be very frightening because now a mistake is serious. People's lives are, played, are placed in danger. Um, whereas my soldiers might just get arrested. Now I know if I can soldiers get captured, they're going to get killed. So if we ever get outnumbered in a pitched battle, we're all dead. Um, and so for Jonathan to come at that time, right when he realizes it's, he's in this, this is a, this is a, this is a root hog or die situation. Um, I think it's very apt. I think it shows us that the Lord um, keeps things from us for a season, but when he reveals them to us, he also is going to give, he's going to give to David what he needs to continue in this particular situation. Yeah. Yeah. Don't Don't see. Root hog or die uh, is an idiom. I don't know it either. Uh, I don't know what that means. It, it means you've got to uh, you you've got to dig down uh, and get this done, or, or else you're you're finished. Uh, so, uh, but, but I could. I, I was thinking, there's no way she heard that before she got to the states. So, Johnny. Where are people? Yes. Yes. I, I think even if he would have gotten captured by Saul and his army uh, uh, and everything, uh, I, I think he would still would have been all there. Okay. All right. Or even if they would have gotten out of number because get. Well, I, it's a different story. But but Gideon's army was outnumbered. Uh, but Gideon had God on his side. So uh, what do you see God, in this story that reminds you about that? Saul didn't have God on his side. So God could have easily protected David from 10,000 or 1,000 different soldiers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mo. Um, I'm thinking like he must have, well, unless I'm missing something in the story. So if I did, I did, but, uh, he must have received this from Jonathan as like prophetic almost or something other than just, cause I would, I, I know personally, I would probably be like, well, he's a, he says, my father won't lay a hand on you. He's saying like, he must know the inside scoop like he's not he's not actually going to pursue me and try to kill me but he actually Saul actually is trying to do that so I think we look at I can we can look at it because I know the story like yeah that he we know he's not but like I just wonder how David took it like did he take it as like well he he's close to his father so he knows I'm hearing all these other things but maybe this is true or is this like um a prophetic prompt you know or just like him him encouraging him like he said like hey you know that he can't lay a hand on you because you know mm-hmm. unless there's something in the story where he, yeah. he refers to that that in that sentence that i missed that i'm forgetting so yeah diane yeah i was thinking how it you know when you come to that realization that you've been so wrong about somebody um that saul is trying to kill you the cat tail, um, that <laughs> maybe you begin to wonder, like, am I, am I really off base on a bunch of other things? Was, was Jonathan really my friend? Uh, is, is any of Israel for me? After all, um, Saul's not traveling around by himself. He's, he's got an army. And so when Jonathan shows up, it, it can keep David from going into that place of everybody hates me, nobody loves me. Oh. Um, so even if you're not, you're like, oh, Jonathan, you're a bit deluded. Your dad really does <laughs> love me. Um, he can believe that um, that Saul's not going to lay a hand on him. Mm. But how disappointing it must be that Jonathan cannot be his second in command. And he would have been so much better than the one that he actually picks. Yeah, yeah. Sarah. 
um, this is making me think about how David's character must have been if 400 men were willing to go out and support him and the king's son who was trying to kill him is on his side. I feel like that says a lot about who David was and how people viewed him. Well, so in this story, if, if David is, if he's having to be encouraged, having courage put in him, uh, so do we see him being a coward here? No. He's downcast. Uh, what was that, don't we? I mean, down, he's downcast right now. Downcast. Ooh, I like that word. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this was also making me think of Psalm 3 when Johnny started saying how there could be tens of thousands surrounding him and in <laughs> I don't know where Psalm 3 fits in to the story but he talks about how I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side and he also talks about how God lifts his head and everything um, so he needs that encouragement but yeah how God fights his battles basically well you know it's it's interesting because David is coming directly from a great victory I mean, God has given them a, he's, he's won a victory with this band of brigands, for lack of a better term, right? Uh, guys that he really doesn't, that they're not an army by any stretch of the imagination at this point, and yet he's won this great victory. And, and then suddenly he realizes Saul's trying to kill me, uh, and he, he, he loses heart there. Uh, so I, and, and that, Jonathan, rather than just saying, cheer up, have courage, the first thing he does is it, he encourages him in his faith in God. So do you see a difference between just courage and courage that comes from a person's faith in God? I feel like it's a stronger foundation. In, in what way? L elaborate on that a little bit. Um, I feel like Jonathan was reminding him of the promise God already gave to him. You are going to be king. Okay. God said, you're going to be king. You're going to be king. So how on earth could my father possibly kill you? Like you're going to, you're surviving this. You're fine. And so that's like a promise he can stand on. That's something real that he knows is going to happen. Even if he's doubting it, that was the, it's a good reminder. Whereas like, oh, it's okay. Like maybe I'll be fine. Maybe I'll survive this. There's nothing really there that you can stand on. Yes, Cheryl. And like in, uh, nowadays, um, there's a lot of encouragement, like you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. You know, this humanistic. Just put your yeah. mind to it. We can, we can yeah. be victorious. If we just believe in ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, I love when somebody says, uh, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. And, and I'm going, you do realize the Jews were basically in slavery at that point. That's, see, I, I don't know that that's the passage you want to go to to be quoted. So, right. Did you have something? Yeah, I was uh, reminded that uh, the encouragement is actually about the uh, the calling that, uh, yeah, you're called to be a king. So uh. using that to, I mean, to, to like, mm. okay, you are called to do this and you haven't done it, so you will be fine. Things like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Diane? I'm just rethinking that last, that last part and I'll be your second in command because mm -hmm. You know, maybe Jonathan is naive enough to think that these two boys may have been brought together by their idealism. Um, but maybe it's also, he knows that can't happen, but it's, it's just a way of offering his support and also saying, don't worry about me that I'm the son of your rival. You know, because it is messy if, if some of the king's sons live and there's a king who dies. Um, maybe Jonathan, you know, we, I, this is all speculation, 
I know, hand raised for speculation. Um, but I think it's just very poignant here. Whatever Jonathan is doing, he's putting all of the focus back on David. You, you, you. And in case you're worried about me, because, you know, I am the son of that um, <laughs> current murderous king. Don't worry about me. Well, now I've, I've got a question for you, Dan. Where in the story do we see that it's not possible for him to be the second in command? I mean, why, why would it not be possible for Jonathan? Je I, it's not in the story, and God can do whatever he wants, but it's, it's very complicated for the way succession works for a king to have his sons, to have a deposed king or a king that's gone, and he has a son working for the new king and they're not related by blood at all. It, yep. it, just, looks, it just looks a little improbable. Um, we also, actually see um, that happen in the life of David later on. But because <laughs> Mephibosheth is adopted by David, who is Jonathan's son. Uh, yeah, but we can eliminate cripples. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mephibosheth is not the second in command. I think it's a fairy tale life is what Diane is explaining here, that for Jonathan to be second in command and command of the army is fairy tale. And it's a quite, it's probable, it's possible. Uh, and because nothing's impossible with God and, and Jonathan perhaps is loyal enough to do that. Mm, yeah. uh, but it's a fairy tale mm. life, I think. I don't know. I, could be yeah, I, I mean, I see Jonathan as being willing to do it, but he's yeah. gonna have sons who are gonna think may, what if a couple of them think of themselves as the grandson of the king? Yeah, um, rightful heirs. Yeah, it, it's, it would have been a complicated, Potential. If it wasn't complicated, that would have only been the grace of God. Yes, yeah, Sarah. At what point was it promised that Saul and his sons would all die before, I guess, when David would become king? Yeah, you know that I'm not sure about the the. It, I'm not sure. Where am I mistaken? Was that not actually? Jonathan died in battle with Saul. Mm -hmm. We yeah. know that, but um, actually, through the covenant with um, Jonathan. He promised that he wouldn't harm any of the family, and yeah. he didn't. He kept that promise. He did. So uh, yeah. he was another place of integrity for David. Yeah. Johnny, I'll, I'll let you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say two things. N number one is uh, Saul so, so was told that he, he had he and his sons were going to die when he cons when he wanted to talk to Samuel and he consulted the witch the witch at Endor. Okay, that's number one. <laughs> then, number two, John Jonathan well, was the same as his dad. He was hung. He he had hung hung good to power for power. And his dad didn't want to give up like his power or his authority. And Jonathan said, oh, I also want to have power and authority. Yeah, I'm not going to open the door to that because that would be a that, that's going to be a long conversation. Uh, but uh, I, I would probably not see that at all. Uh, but I, I can see where somebody like get there. So, but in the story, we saw that David, I mean, he had had this tremendous victory that he'd invested, uh, you know, he'd, he'd invested his, his men and himself uh, into protecting this, uh, you know, this, this town. And then he's told, yeah, they're going to betray you at the first opportunity. Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and then David leaves and goes to the wilderness of, of sin. Uh, and when we see that he is discouraged, right? 
So to, today, uh, when are, are there still times that, that people betray others that, that leads godly people to, to feelings of discouragement? That still happen? Well, what might what what kind of situations might we see today where that betrayal would take place or that you no know, most of us don't have situations where a, we're going to be betrayed to a king uh, right but <laughs> what could betrayal by somebody that we've invested in look like today be in uh i mean it could be in business i guess yeah um unfortunately church you know yeah. but uh but yeah like in business i mean you know you might take somebody under your wing and invest in them and yeah and then they go off to another company or something they learn from you and then go start their own company and become your competitor I don't know. Yeah, I said I, I was just talking to somebody this week that kind of thing had happened. So yeah, yeah. What else might that look like? Yeah, John. Yes. Well, yeah. Uh, when I was in college, I tried to work in what they what they group of people. In a group, uh, in a group talk, and I did not enjoy working because I'm the type of person. It's like, okay, it's turned in. Now let's get it done as soon as possible, so we can get it out of the way. <laughs> but but the people I was working with, that they want to do the things at the last minute. So I kind of was giving my observation and saying, hey, so, so what do y'all want me to do? Which part? Because I would never, I would suggest a part that would, that would always tell me, Johnny, you always want to do everything and blah, blah, blah. So then I said, oh, oh, okay, you guys go ahead and tell me which part y'all want me to do. Anyway. We had a group messenger chat. Uh, they ended up kicking me out of the group chat. <laughs> and when they eventually ended up putting, putting me back in, I went to go see the conversation before, before I got put back in. And they were just talking bad about, about me behind my back. So I felt kind of betrayed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Well, I'm curious, you know, you, you mentioned that. Oh, yeah, Diane, go ahead. I, I was just going to put in that that the situation, I think the uh, the large betrayal that that happens all the time is uh, someone who's as invested in their spouse mm -hmm. and then that spouse betrays them, um, cheats on them or simply chooses to wander off and that that's a huge and discouraging betrayal yeah 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 well, and we all end up we, and probably at some point in our lives we'll end up ministering to someone yeah. in that situation absolutely you, you you bring that up and, and johnny hearing what you said there i mean what is there in this story that could help us as individuals when we're dealing with that sense of betrayal, like you were talking about, Johnny, or uh, Dan, like you were talking about, we're, we're trying to help somebody walk through, whether it's a marriage betrayal or, you know, like Mo was talking about a business betrayal. Uh, what, what is there in this story that we might be able to pass off to somebody else to help them? Well, I mean, it's not so much for me in this story, but just the history, knowing that God did what he promised for David. 
Um, it's not complete in the story, but, you know, and then we, I mean, from a personal standpoint, we, we have the word of God. So it's, it's great if we have a friend that comes and encourages us. That's awesome. We should call a friend. Yes. Um, but we also have, um, we also have the scriptures too. Yeah. Worship, lots of, lots of wonderful things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Cheryl. Well, we could like, like Susan was saying about the friend, we it could encourage us to be that friend. And if somebody's really discouraged to realize that oh, maybe our words, um, maybe God will use us to encourage them so much that he'll end up doing some just fantastic things with that person. And, and if not, I mean, that person could, <laughs> could end up uh, not, not being victorious, you know, in, his, in, in what God wants him to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Andrew? You know, um, uh, those 400 men that were with David, um, there's, some, there's some good stories about them. One of them killed 800 men in battle. Yeah. So the story I think that is touching here is that the story is not over. Oh, oh, I like that. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's it's continuing. This is just part of what God's dealing with and writing the story. And it's not just your story. Yeah. Because it's just not about David. It's about those heroes that he had too went down into a pit on a snowy day. Yeah. Killed a lion. Uh, defended a, bar, a barley field or kind of whatever field that was. Yeah. Um, that he produced not just a great leadership and not just a great kingdom, but great people with what he had to work with. So I think that's, I think I can take that away from the story. It's not the end of the story. Yeah, yeah and, and I love the fact that what you, what you said was he didn't start with the cream of the crop, you know, but that's what he ended no, up with. Uh, yeah. Know, he ended up with the best. The best. Just... <laughs> so, yeah which I think for all of us could be encouraging. Don't we? Thinking about that, when David, uh, he experienced being betrayed, but in the meantime, he also experienced uh, uh, friendship and loyalty from Jonathan. Yes. That's the, the two sides of the coin in this story. So that's how God encouraged him unexpectedly by bring him, bringing him the son of his enemy to encourage him yeah yeah that's, that's something beautiful yeah well this story is in first samuel chapter 23 verses 14 through 18 uh and uh this is a great story if you have the opportunity to to be in a church this is a great from the pulpit story uh to, to be able to share or you know, if you deal with us, especially the scenario that everybody's in right now with the pandemic, I mean, people are, people are naturally discouraged, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, it's just, you know, we were at, we were at a, a college event last night and just listening to students talk and I'm going, you know, oh my, you've, you've got cars, you're at a major university, you're in a dorm, you've got food. Uh, the clothes on your back. Life is good. <laughs> Most of the people around you wear masks. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, it's it, it's it could be a whole lot worse. Uh, so in most places it is. So it's. Uh, uh, I, I love stories like this, just to to hand off to people and let them mull over a little bit. So, all right. Well, thank you guys. I'm about to hit stop recording. So.